Well, certainly when we don't hear somebody, there's great frustration. There's a barrier in social relationships. Uh, there's a higher risk of depression. And if prolonged, there's even a higher risk of dementia. What I'm seeing a lot in practice is people noticing they can't hear when a mask is being worn. Wearing proper hearing protection in a workplace that is too loud is clearly something that needs to get uh, taken care of. You can now stream your, all of your audio through your hearing aids and through the phone. That means nice, hands-free, very clear phone calls. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Marissa Lennox. Welcome to The Zoomer, I'm Marissa Lennox. It's one of the most common chronic health conditions that Canadian adults experience. If you have a hearing loss, you may think it's something you can live with. But hearing loss is about more than losing some level of hearing. It can also impact your day-to-day -day life, including your mental health and well-being. On today's show, signs, symptoms, causes, and treatments for hearing loss, including the newest and most advanced hearing technologies on the market. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. Hearing loss is more common than you might think. Excuse me. What? Huh. More than half of Canadians between the ages of 40 and 79 have at least mild hearing loss. But 77% of them do not know it. According to the study, men are more likely than women to have hearing loss, as are older adults. In those aged 70 to 79, the prevalence was 93%. While it's a problem often linked to aging, there are many other causes, including exposure to loud noise. An estimated 11 million Canadians work in a noisy environment. And over half are not required to use hearing protection. Meanwhile, approximately 37% of Canadian adults experienced tinnitus in the past year. But no matter where you are in your hearing loss journey, it's important to remain educated about your options. You know, Gordana, many Canadians are not even aware they suffer from hearing loss. They often say people with hearing loss are the last to know. In a recent Canadian survey, what was found was that 77% of people with even a slight hearing loss didn't know that they suffered from it. Why do you think that is? Well, I think overall, um, people don't tend to go get their hearing checked. Even my own father, I take it from a personal perspective, it's taken him quite a while, even though I am uh, working in, uh, in a nonprofit organization and involved, our, my children have a hearing loss and we've been exposed to it. It's almost a stigma as far as getting your hearing tested and thinking that it's not okay. Um, I don't know if it's more of a vanity point, but he expressed it as far as I don't know if it's my hearing, but I don't really want to get a hearing aid. It's not for me, but mm. I saw the withdrawal, not only from the television being amplified, but also the isolation too. Um, but people start to isolate once they notice that the hearing is, uh, they're losing their hearing that they start to withdraw, which is quite complex. Jillian, would you agree that a big part of it has to do with stigma and just this desire to not follow through with the ultimate end, which would be a hearing aid potentially? Yeah, absolutely. I definitely think that it is associated with um, an outward sign of getting older, uh, of aging. Even though hearing loss is not uh, something that is only in an aging population, we see hearing loss across all populations, all ages. So that stigma does apply, and unfortunately, it's it's sticking, which you know is a, is just sad because we want to see things change over time, but we're not seeing much of a change. The penetration rate is only about 20%, which means that only 20% of those who um, can benefit from hearing aids are actually wearing hearing aids. Dr. Holland, what are some of the signs then that people can watch out for if they think they might be suffering from hearing loss or they're curious if maybe their hearing has been impacted to some extent? Uh, what are some of those key signs that people can look out for? I think. You know, uh, we mentioned also turning the TV quite high, people noticing that the volume's up. Um, back when we used to be in crowds or restaurants, um, not being able to hear. I think COVID has made it more difficult for people to see those 
um, sort of more subtle signs where they they may in a crowd they may not be able to hear, but if they're one on one with someone, they they are able to hear. Mm. What I'm seeing a lot in practice is people noticing they can't hear when a mask is being worn. So that's been interesting as well. Oh, is that because they can't read the lips and depend on that so much? Yeah, and I think hearing loss when you see it, it it happens often gradually, right? Like. Sometimes we have sudden hearing loss, which can be an emergency, but having this sort of subtle ongoing hearing loss, you may not notice, um, you know, the next day that you've, you know, lost some hearing. Um, and so what I'm seeing is that I, I think patients are relying somewhat on, on a combination of lip reading as well as um, hearing. And then when you take away um, the, the lips, then they, they are sort of realizing that they can't rely on that anymore. That's a good point. Peter, can you give us a real world example of a situation where a loud noise could trigger some hearing loss, like a concert or something like that? We may not even realize it's having an effect on us. I, one of the ways that people are impacted without realizing is, is for example, when uh, with the discharge of firearms, hmm. it's a very short, but very intense sound level that can do damage very quickly. So when they're at a shooting range or something like that. Shooting range, how about construction? If you were to live next to say a construction project? Living next to a construction project is less so of a concern. The greater concern is for those people working at the construction site. And Dr. Myers, I mean, what do we know about the relationship say between hearing loss and earbuds? Well, we know that prolonged toxic sound at high decibels is more of a problem than just short range sound. But I want to go back to your earlier question about why people are slow to recognize and, and accept that they have hearing loss. And as one such person, let me say, it's not just stigma. It's also because as Dr. Holland said, the, the change is so imperceptibly gradual. Moreover, as a person with hearing loss, I'm simply ignorant of what I don't hear. If somebody says my name from behind and I don't respond because I didn't hear it, they count it as a miss. I don't count it as a miss. I'm aware of what I do hear. And what I hear sounds normal to me because it's the only experience I have. I'm ignorant of what other people's experiences are. So I can't compare my hearing to anybody else's hearing. And if I have trouble hearing, it's very easy to attribute it to something external to somebody else's mumbling, to external noise, to somebody's soft voice. So there's some simple, what I call cognitive explanations for why we're slow to recognize our own hearing loss. Hmm. Is hearing loss on the rise, Dr. Myers? Uh, it has been on the rise with the increase in toxic noise and with the aging of the population. Uh, and so we have uh, things in our ears uh, that expose us to more sound. And as more and more of us get older, because of the association of hearing loss and age, more and more people are gonna be needing to visiting the hearing professionals who are here with us today. And Stephanie, we know too, when we're in large crowds, um, it's so difficult, you know, Dr. Maras pointed out, it's difficult to hear. You might not even realize that you suffer from some hearing loss because there's all this background noise. What's Hearing Loops doing to support people with hearing loss in that situation? Um, yeah, that's a great question, Marissa. Thank you. So um, induction loops are really important for people that wear um, hearing assistive technology that do have something called a telecoil or T-coil present in the device. And um, what we're doing as part of our organization is we're getting the message out that induction loop um, technology is available in Canada and is really very helpful for people that do have um, a, you know, either a cochlear implant or a hearing aid that has the telecoil present because what it does is help to ground the noise that they're intended to hear, whether it's instructions from someone at a bank, um, at a bank teller in a public space or even within their own workplace. Um, if you're sitting around a boardroom table, hopefully we'll be returning to that at some point in the near future. Someone that may be hard of hearing can benefit by their employer installing loop technology to help them, again, hear what they're supposed to be hearing rather than background noise, which is, which is very common. I benefit from the hearing loops that she was describing. I have one in my home. So my TV broadcasts through my hearing aids, which are customized wireless in the ear TV speakers. My office, where I'm speaking to you, the phone broadcasts through both my hearing aids, where I worship my campus auditoriums. 
And more and more here in the United States, as well as in Canada, we're seeing this hearing loop technology spread. It's coming to all New York City airports. Uh, all, the, all the gate areas uh, is coming to uh, more and more worship places and auditoriums. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, it's fantastic, let me tell you, it is a godsend. And it alleviates the frustration of being left out as someone with the invisible disability of hearing loss. All right, thank you for that. We need to take a short break. There's more when we return. So when we think of hearing loss, um, it's a communication disorder, and we as humans connect with people via communication. Welcome back. Hearing loss is an effect on more than just your ability to hear. Hearing plays a major role in our emotional well-being, mental health, and overall quality of life. Yet, millions of people ignore the signs, despite research showing alarming consequences if left untreated. So, Dr. Myers, why don't I start with you on this one? As somebody who lives with hearing loss, what would you say are some of the psychological characteristics of hearing impairment? Well, certainly when we don't hear somebody, there's great frustration. There's a barrier in social relationships. Uh, there's a higher risk of depression. And if prolonged, there's even a higher risk of dementia. Dr. Holland, Dr. Myers just mentioned their depression as, as one of the characteristics, uh, psychological characteristics. And I think that, that it makes intuitive sense that there would be a connection between hearing loss and depression. There's also a very big difference between someone who uses a hearing aid to help them with minor hearing loss and someone who has lost their hearing completely. What is the difference in those characteristics between those two people? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think isolation is a big one. I think when you're, um, depending on when you lost your hearing, um, the way that you learn to adapt to that uh, situation, whether it's later in life or earlier in life, I think it makes a really big difference and, and what kind of support network you have as well. Um, whether you have others in your life who have hearing loss as well. Um, and there are networks and communities that um, are able to kind of um, have different ways of communicating. Jillian, do you think it's easy to attribute those signs, uh, depression, isolation, to something else and not hearing loss? I think that they are unfortunate consequences of hearing loss. Yes, absolutely. You can experience those things outside of hearing loss. But when we think of hearing loss, um, it's a communication disorder. And we as humans connect with people via communication. So you can understand easily how it would actually affect you so deeply and in all aspects of life. And I think we should also mention that it's not just the person with hearing loss that is affected, that those around them are also affected, loved ones, that it has an, an impact on relationships. Because again, we communicate with the ones around us and this is how we express ourselves and how we connect. So it, it's, it affects a lot of people. It can also affect your family members as well and they can be experiencing the same sorts of, of symptoms or um, you know, negative side effects. Can I just ask Jillian, can hearing worsen if left untreated? Yes. Uh, hearing loss uh, is typically progressive anyways. So as we, uh, as we age, it does tend to worsen over time. But there is research to indicate that the longer you go um, with untreated hearing loss, the harder it is to get that back or to, for the brain to sort of respond to those sounds once we stimulate the brain again. So you're never doing yourself any good by waiting. Um, you know, Gordana, there's no question we place a high value on our hearing, and yet so few people who know they have hearing loss, it was mentioned earlier, I think only 20% actually do something about it. Why do you think that is? Well, again, it's difficult to answer for each individual is, uh, is it's their own reason why they go get their hearing tested for sure. But I think overall, too, we talked about a lot of things here. A lot is about, it is about communication barriers and accessibility, too. Once you get your hearing aid, uh, once you get fitted, et cetera, and it's going outside the home and what barriers you face. And that seems to be a big 
issue too, as far as in the States, I think they're far advanced in some areas, but in Canada, we're moving forward in so many areas, having the induction loop systems uh, beyond in uh, retail stores, et cetera, that those communication barriers are removed. And we need to work harder towards that in, uh, across Canada, that once you have the hearing aid, it doesn't mean it's all fixed and one hearing aid fix all, we're all, we all vary. We need to break down those communication barriers. That is key. Can you prevent hearing loss? Peter, I'll ask you. Is it something that you can prevent? Prevention is something that needs to happen long before people notice it. And that's because a lot of hearing loss is connected with workplace noise. Uh, wearing proper hearing protection in a workplace that is too loud is clearly something that needs to get uh, taken care of. Um, ideally, the workplace workplaces need to become quieter, but it's typically something that people have the damage, at least, at least the initial damage, long before they have the experience of it. And so young people may not be as careful in their workplace as they ought to be and suffer later. So it could be something as simple as even um, if we were talking, you know, about prevention, you may not be aware that you're listening to your earbuds too loudly, or you, you know, you may not be aware that perhaps if you're at a super loud concert, you should, uh, you could put those orange earbuds in your ears to help protect them. Many people don't do that. Maybe they don't even think about it. Exactly. And then what can be done further then to mitigate the damage that has already been done? Dr. Myers. Well, I'm not sure this would mitigate the damage, but I was privileged to serve four years on the National Institute on Deafness Advisory Council, where I got to know a University of High Iowa hearing geneticist. And I have a very peculiar uh, pattern of hearing loss. And he invited me to send in a test tube of spit and he analyzed the genes and can find a very specific gene that is causing my hearing loss. So I asked him, could you use the CRISPR gene editing technology to potentially prevent hearing loss long-term in a young person who carries this gene? And he said, absolutely. And that's the next phase of our research. And in fact, we're able to administer this, uh, this technology in one ear, but not the other, which we can use as a control or comparison condition. So maybe in the distant future, we'll be able to pre prevent some of the hearing loss we now have with, with uh, genetic engineering. That's neat, all right. Well, don't go away. There's more on the other side of this break. I had closed fitting hearing aids that made my own voice sound as if my head were in a bucket. Many of today's hearing aids are open fitting and don't have that and they're easier to adapt to. Welcome back. Researcher and social psychologist Dr. David Myers is not only an internationally known author of textbooks and general interest books, he's also an advocate for hearing-friendly assistive technology. Dr. Myers, who has himself suffered hearing loss, joins me now to talk about his journey. So, you know, Dr. Myers, first of all, can you describe your hearing loss for us? How severe is it? Uh, my audiologist calls it severe. If I take out my hearing aids, I cannot hear my wife on the pillow next to me. When did you first notice there was an issue? I inherited the hearing loss from my mother that she got from her mother. And so I was first tested when I was a teenager. I was the case of the, the neurological case of the month as a graduate student at the University of Iowa. But I, for reasons we've discussed already on our program, uh, didn't get hearing aids until my early 40s. And uh, since then, the hearing loss has been progressive. It's almost complete in the left ear but I'm still able to have conversation as we're having right now. But I may, before my life is over, be a cochlear implant candidate. Uh, how did you feel when you were first diagnosed? Um, I think I just kind of <laughs> understood it. I think I had trouble adapting to hearing aids initially. The audiologist with us here today will understand what I'm saying. I had closed fitting hearing aids that made my own voice sound as if my head were in a bucket. Mm -hmm. Many of today's hearing aids are open fitting and don't have that and they're easier to adapt to. Now, however, once I've adapted to the hearing aids and it takes time, but I would encourage people to be patient to do it, I couldn't live without them. And I very soon realized how important they were to my well being and how important hearing is to our functioning as social animals. So 
would you say that your hearing loss affected you um, emotionally at all? Yes, and it also affected my ability to teach and to be able to hear students' questions and respond without sweating bullets because I, no matter what, how they repeated their question, I couldn't understand it. And that ultimately led my, to my uh, backing off from teaching and becoming a full-time textbook writer and researcher. Has COVID impacted your, your situation at all? Uh, certainly, as uh, we've discussed earlier, it's led to a masked world. A very big part of hearing is lip reading. It's also reading facial expressions. And we're blocked off from that very important channel of information, so, as well as the acoustic muffling that, uh, that a face mask entails. There are some clear masks that allow us to see others' mouths, but, uh, they muffle sound even more. And so we're, we, people with hearing loss, are so looking forward to the pandemic ending. So when did you become then an advocate for hearing loops? I became an advocate for hearing loops after visiting the Iona Abbey off the west coast of Scotland in 1999. I couldn't hear a thing as sound reverberated around that enormous uh, cathedral. And then my wife noticed there was a sign on the wall with a ear symbol and a little T at the bottom that indicated this was telecoil compatible assistive listening. Now the telecoil is what St Stephanie mentioned earlier, a little magnetic receptor in the hearing aid costs essentially nothing. You turn that on and suddenly the speakers are not up in the ceiling, they're right inside my ears. I was in tears, the sound was so deliciously clear. <laughs> and, and I thought, my goodness, North Americans ought to have access to this technology too, which is spread all over Scandinavia and the United Kingdom. And so that led me back here to, to, to experiment with my community, where now virtually every worship place and auditorium has this, to create a website, hearingloop.org, and then to join with others in North America to advocate for the spread of this technology in the United States and in Canada. And it's so exciting to see it gaining momentum. So much progress has been made on that front, probably yes. a lot to do with your advocacy. And that of many others. Okay. And simultaneously, Bluetooth has been a wonderful, but very different and complementary technology that allows my smartphone to communicate through my two hearing aids. And believe me, people, if you have trouble listening to the phone, you would not believe how much better you can understand if you hear telephone conversation through two ears rather than one. So, so where would you say then are the opportunities to do better? The opportunities to do better are first of all, for any auditorium or worship place that, that delivers, uh, it has a public address system. It should take account not only in its accessibility policies, not only of people in wheelchairs with mobility impairments, but also the, the great vast number of Canadians who have the invisible disability of hearing loss and to provide the simplest, most optimum hearing technology, which is a hearing loop, which means I don't have to check out special equipment. It doesn't deliver generic sound. I can just press a button and my hearing aid delivers sound customized for my ears from the speakers right inside my ears. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Up next, we'll show you the most advanced hearing technologies on the market. Don't go away. So you want natural sound coming in, but you also want to experience true sound. And this new hearing aid called the MORE is, is really trying to uh, simulate a natural and real world uh, environment. Welcome back. Shopping for hearing aids can be challenging, especially if you haven't purchased them before. Some come with lots of options and settings, while others are simpler to use. Jillian joins me now with an array of options based on common concerns. What are people most often looking for today when searching for a hearing aid? Uh, I think people are looking for something that's comfortable, um, usually small. If they could, you know, if they could choose, they want something small. And obviously, they want good sound quality and reliability. And you know, thankfully, the hearing aids of today can provide and, and really meet the needs of, of users in all of those categories. And how do you help them choose then which one is right for them? So it's a mixture of um, 
obviously looking at the um, test results. So we do need to understand the degree of loss, the type of loss. Um, we, that really determines which hearing aids will be suitable, but it's also a mix of what the user wants. So it's your personal preference, what you would like in a hearing aid, what you want in terms of style and size. So we, we come to sort of a, you know, an agreement of how can we provide the best audiological results and performance of the hearing aids, but also meeting your personal preferences. So at Hearing Life, what are your um, newest models that you're, sh that you're showing? Yeah, so I, it's probably quite small on the screen, but I am holding the latest hearing aid it is very small i apologize but that's what people want is a small hearing aid and actually dr myers made reference of the um the change for him with wearing a hearing aid that made him feel um, plugged up or occluded versus a hearing aid that keeps the ear open now this model in particular does exactly that and he's right the the overall feel and um, satisfaction is much higher when you can keep that ear canal open and you can have a sort of a natural sound. And this, this hearing aid in particular does that. So you want natural sound coming in, but you also want to experience true sound. And this new hearing aid called the MORE is, is really trying to uh, simulate a natural and real world environment. So exactly what's going on in your environment is, is what you're going to hear at the brain level. This is what the brain wants. The brain wants to understand what's truly going on around you and your entire environment so that it can do the processing necessary in order for you to make sense of the world around you. And that's what's so special about this hearing aid. It's using artificial intelligence to do this and it's simulating the truest, most natural um, sound environment for individuals who don't have true and natural sound because of the degradation from the hearing loss. That makes so much sense that you would want your ears to be open, that it, otherwise it would sound like you were. I know even if I'm um, on a Zoom call and I have both earbuds in my ear, not the same, I can appreciate that, but I often take one out so that I can hear. And so, does it, are you saying that maybe the technology would provide the same effect? Yes. Like, you know, he explained it as a head in a barrel, the head in a barrel effect. That's, that's very accurate. It almost feels like your head's in a barrel. There's an echo. And we don't hear our voices like that naturally. So when you change the tonal quality of your voice as well as the volume, it's very noticeable and usually quite annoying. So if we can remove that from the user's experience, it definitely helps to improve satisfaction rates with hearing aids and the performance of the aid and just really the overall comfort of wearing the hearing aids all day long when your own voice doesn't have to be changed. It sounds like what you're used to hearing yourself. So yeah, it's a great um, advancement. And not this, this style of hearing aid has been around for a while, so it's not brand brand new, but we definitely find that users are much more happier with this style. And for those who may not benefit from a hearing aid, what are some of the other options that you have? If hearing aids are not an option at all, there are also accessories. So some individuals, if they're not ready for a hearing aid, they might look at you know, noise canceling headphones or devices to help them hear the TV or streaming audio that isn't a hearing aid itself. However, I would stress that if you have treatable hearing loss, that really you should be wearing a hearing aid to stimulate the brain as much as you possibly can. So I, I would not recommend looking for maybe a cheaper um, solution. I would go see a regulated healthcare professional and uh, based on their recommendations, that I'm sure that there would be something that would be suitable for you. And that's really the best way to treat hearing loss. What would you say to someone who would say to you, I don't need a hearing aid, my hearing loss is only mild. Yeah, I hear that all the time. That's very common. Uh, and it again goes back to that it is gradual and very subtle and happens over years. And so it is often um, hard for users to know and that what they're missing because they don't know what they're missing if they're not hearing it. But I would just say, I mean, it really does affect your overall quality of life and your well-being. It's one of your five senses. 
and it affects you every day because you need your ears to hear. And I mean, you, this is how we communicate with people. So I don't think that waiting is, is a good thing. I, I tell people all the time that you, you really need to act now um, instead of later. Can you tell us a little bit about the new technologies out there that pair with your phone, for example? Yeah, so Bluetooth technology is sort of the, the cat's meow for hearing aids, and uh, that really opens up the world for those with who are currently wearing hearing aids and may not even know that they have the ability to access Bluetooth. There are several different accessories that you can pair with your hearing aid, your smartphone being probably the one that people would understand that you can now stream your all of your audio through your hearing aids and through the phone. That means nice, hands-free, very clear phone calls. And I mean, for years, hearing aid users used to tell me that they couldn't even use a cell phone because they could not hear on a cell phone. Um, but now that call streams directly to their ears through both ears, through the hearing aids with very good clarity. And that really opens up your world and your freedom and flexibility of being able to communicate on something like a cell phone. Another huge game changer I think would be the accessory that you can hook up to your TV because many people struggle to hear dialogue on the television or to watch TV with family members. You know, a spouse wants the volume at a certain level, but the, the person with the hearing loss wants it louder. And so, you know, it causes arguments. So now that, that person can have control over their own volume and hear the dialogue on the TV much more clearly. That means news, you know, if you like to watch the news or sports or movies where dialogue can sometimes be muffled or muddled. So that really opens up, again, more opportunity to enjoy life with uh, the new accessories that are available. Now, obviously, this will vary depending on what it is you need, um, but what someone looking at in terms of a price tag? The accessories themselves are typically not overly expensive. Most range anywhere between 200 and 500. That's reasonable. And how about for the hearing aids? Now that's a bigger range and more costly. So the, you know, hearing aids are an investment, but it's an investment in your quality of life, and it's one of your five senses. The range is typically anywhere between a thousand to four thousand per device. Are there any funding subsidies that are available for people? Yes, absolutely. Um, but that does depend on where you live. So in Canada, where I am, although there's not very much really uh, federal funding that is applicable for everybody, there typically is some, some provincial funding. So depending on what province you live in, you maybe uh, have access to some funding. All right, thanks so much, Jillian. There's more after the break, stay tuned. By improving the acoustics of a space, there's also the possibility that people are less dependent on hearing aids. Welcome back. While well, hearing aids are an excellent tool for improving someone's access to sound, they may not be enough to overcome all listening environments. Background noise and listening at a distance are two environments where hearing aids can fall short. Fortunately, there are solutions for this. Stephanie, let me start with you. Hearing Loops Canada is an amazing organization, so tell me a bit about the Hearing Loop technology. Yeah, so we are partnered with a company called Contacta based in the United Kingdom, and they are a global leader in hearing assistive technology. And um, we do have the rights to distribute that product in Canada, and we've done quite a bit of work um, nationally in order to advocate and educate Canadians about the importance of induction loops. And really that's that's been our, our passion up to this point. Um, we do have a range of products that can be offered, whether it's one-to-one -one at a window or kiosk, um, as I mentioned earlier, like a bank environment or even now with COVID um, being obviously quite prevalent in our discussion points. It's also been something that 
um, has been investigated for um, different clinics and testing centers. And we, again, can also deploy within large theater settings or corporate environments. So really there is an induction loop technology that can be deployed in pretty much any space. And as Dr. Myers mentioned earlier, even within a home um, through our home loop kit that we can also uh, provide to um, customers that, that want to experience an induction loop within their own private environment. Where can Canadians find the induction loop system currently? So our, you can, any, any Canadian that's interested in getting more information can reach out to me personally. Our website is um, hearingloopscanada.com. I'm based in Ontario. Um, the company was founded in, in Alberta. Can you give me an example of a setting though where, it, where it's currently being used? Oh, absolutely. So we've done various deployments. Um, for example, the Citadel Theater in Edmonton, Alberta, um, is one of the uh, key areas where we've done a large, um, a large loop induction loop setting. And then um, recently, we've been doing quite a few deployments with the one to one windows because of COVID and the barriers that have gone up. Uh, the speech transfer systems have really helped to um, not only uh, advocate for people with hearing loss with the hearing loop aerial, but even for those that struggle to hear because of masks and the barrier being in place. So it's amplifying the noise between the barrier. Dr. Myers mentioned difficulty in a church setting hearing and, yes. and you know, how prevalent are the, is the hearing loop technology in religious settings across the country? very prevalent. It's it's actually probably the largest um, area where or segment where induction loops have been deployed. So on our website, we do have a locator that will show where induction loops have been deployed. And I would say the majority at this point have been um, within uh, places of worship. Gordana, a quarter of the population has some sort of hearing loss, um, I've read. So when we talk about accessibility, what still needs to be done in, to make Canada more accessible for people with hearing impairment? Um, I think it's very important for us in Canada to do so. We are working towards it, obviously in Ontario with the AODA, with the uh, Accessible Ontario's uh, Act, uh, we're working towards that. But overall, we need to make it accessible for all of us from something as simple as the captioning on television and no hearing aids and uh, as far as amplifying sound though too, but understanding and educating ourselves. And like I said, as far as the Canadian Heart and Hearing Association, we have so much resources and education available that we all benefit from it and understanding what can be done, where we can go to make Canada accessible to all. Uh, we need to be part of the conversation. Uh, people with the hearing loss need to be included everywhere. And like I said, as far as uh, with the hearing aids and being in uh, meeting settings, et cetera, we need to make that accessible all areas outside of the home and in retailers, uh, uh, other stores, anywhere that people do not have access to that. So we really want to push for that. Peter, same question to you. I mean, what opportunities are there to do better? Opportunities. Um to address existing situations also occur where we can improve the acoustics of a space. I mean, certainly induction loops can help in situations where the acoustics of a space is poor, but by improving the acoustics of a space, there's also the possibility that people are less dependent on hearing aids or induction loops, that people that have some hearing loss but don't yet have a hearing aid, um, are able to actually hear better. How would that work? That would work, for example, by controlling the reflections in a room. So the sound that we hear that is very close to the first sound we hear is something that our ear processes together and uses that as the signal we want to hear. But the sound that comes from later reflections stuff that bounces off the back walls and comes back later on, acts like noise. And so we actually get interference from the same signal that just happens to show up later. So getting control of the sound in the room is something that is very significant to helping people that have some loss, but no support system yet. Does that happen after a room is constructed or does it happen while it's being constructed? Ideally, it's done while it's being constructed the cost to do it after it is constructed is usually quite a bit higher. 
That would make sense. And Jillian, you know, let me let me close out with you. Same question. Where are the opportunities to do better here? Yeah, I mean, I work in private practice, so um, you know, accessibility to me is accessibility to a hearing test. And so, you know, our healthcare system does not cover hearing assessments. So for me, it's very important that Canadians have the opportunity to have their hearing tested uh, and don't have to worry about a charge or a fee involved. So the accessibility I would like to see is, um, you know, complimentary hearing assessments that any Canadian can get that information and, and not have to worry about the fee. All right, when we come back, we'll hear some final thoughts from our panelists. Welcome back. It's that time in the show for final thoughts. So we'll start with you, Jillian. So the final thought for me would be the importance of a baseline hearing test. So I hope uh, the viewers really get out there, get their hearing checked if they haven't already. Um, it, we are an essential service. So even during the pandemic, you can get your hearing tested. Uh, knowledge is power. So understanding where your hearing is at is very key and, and most important. Stephanie. Thank you. Yes, definitely having both the public and private sector recognizing the importance of acknowledging accessibility and um, really opening up their eyes and, and ears, of course, to um, folks that are hard of hearing and finding technologies such as induction loops to, to assist those that, that are struggling. Gordana. Thank you. And again, looking for support. And at the Canadian Hard of Hearing Association, we do have a free uh, peer mentoring program available across Canada for outreach. So people can talk to one of our mentors and get the support that they need through our mentoring program. So I encourage you all. Dr. Holland? Yeah, I would say get checked. If you think you might have some hearing loss, if you're noticing that um, it's harder to hear people, especially when they're wearing a mask, that could be a sign that you have some hearing loss. So please get assessed. And Peter. For me, the most significant thing is prevention. I think there should be more effort put into uh, hearing prevention, uh, hearing loss prevention efforts, uh, where industry and government are promoting hearing conservation plans for, for industry. It should become necessary for every industry to have that. All right, well, a big thank you to my panelists for being here and for you at home watching. We'll see you soon. For now, it's time to zoom out.